Hello, my name is Isabella and on behalf of the Open Gov Hub, I'd like to welcome you to our fireside chat. The Open Gov Hub is a dynamic meeting place that brings together nearly 60 organizations that work on issues of transparency, accountability, and civic participation. Leaders from three of those organizations, Frank Vogel from Partnership for Transparency, our co-organizer of this event, Johannes Tan from Global Integrity, the Hub's co-founder, and Shruti Shah from Coalition for Integrity, one of our members, gathered at the Hub on November 17th to discuss Frank Vogel's new book, The Enablers, How the West Supports Kleptocrats and Corruption, Endangering Our Democracy. Now, please join me to watch a recording of the event and share your thoughts in the comments below about this informative and engaging discussion. Thank you. The main part of our event are, of course, our speakers and my colleague, Rachel from BTF, will introduce them for you. So thanks again for being here. If you have any questions afterwards, come grab me. Well, thank you, Isabella. I'm going to speak from back here. But as Isabella said, my name is Rachel Ansley. I'm the Communications Manager at PPF. Thank you so much to everyone who's here with us in person and everyone joining online. We appreciate you taking the time to join us for this event. I'm just going to say a few words about one of our speakers, Frank Vogel. Frank is the founder and uh, chairman of the board of the Partnership for Transparency. He's also a co-founder and former ch vice chairman of Transparency International. He served as president of Vogel Communications and International communications consulting firm from 1990 to 2018 and teaches a graduate course at Georgetown University on corruption, conflict resolution, and security. Frank is the author of the book that we are here to discuss today, The Enablers, How the West Supports Kleptocrats excuse me, and Corruption Endangering Our Democracy. Frank is joined by Shruti Shah, President and CEO of Coalition for Integrity, uh, also a PTO board member and Johannes Tan, Director of Integrity and Anti-Corruption at Global Integrity. What we do at Global Integrity is we, we try to figure out how we as a space of anti-corruption organizations, of individuals working on anti-corruption, how we might take approaches that are more effective in us getting in getting us to a point where we where we curb corruption, where we make a dent in this in this conundrum that we all face, knowing there is corruption, knowing and trying different approaches, and then oftentimes understanding that although we make some progress, we're not there yet. So so that is what we try to work out. And uh, yeah, very happy to be here and to be discussing your book. Thank you for for having us. All right. Well, good afternoon. I'm Frank Bo, and thank you for coming. Um, I started out really following the money as a journalist. I know I hate to say this, but it was 50 years ago uh, when I found myself investigating the then largest financial fraud in the world. It was called Investors Overseas Services. It was with a guy called Bernie Kornfeld, uh, a great playboy the bank who basically helped to steal over $2 billion, which in 1970 was a lot of money. And then I came to Washington as a reporter uh, for the Times of London. And one of the things that I became fascinated with was following hearings on Capitol Hill into the bribe paid by major US corporations overseas. And that led to the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which Jimmy Carter signed in late 1977. So I've been sort of following the money for a long time. I took uh, nine years off from following the money in a precise way uh, when I joined the World Bank. But that gave me a first-hand experience in so many countries of how people were complaining about corruption in ways that I had never heard before. Um, and in all this time, I've constantly been looking about how corruption affects the poor, how it destabilizes countries leads to massive distortions of public finances, leads to enormous kickbacks, particularly in infrastructure procurement. And each time, the poor in the countries are the, are the real victims. So much of the poverty in the world is due to the fact that resources, public resources that should be used for sanitation, for basic services, health, education, are stolen. What I had not adequately looked at was whether we, meaning the Northern countries, the democratic countries, the richest countries, whether we were complicit in this corruption. 
And the more I dug into illicit finance, into money laundering, the more I realized that the biggest thieves, that the biggest authoritarian countries could not get their money out of the country and park it safely in safe secret investments without lawyers, bankers, auditors, real estate brokers, art dealers, high-end jewelers, financial consultants on Wall Street in the city of London, in basically the world's major financial centers. And those people are what I call in this book, the enablers, because they are the facilitators of aiding and abetting the transfer of a staggering amount of money. Now, I don't want to go through the whole book with you. I just tell you, I sort of set the scene, the first few chapters. I then look at the bankers, and I'm going to come back to them in a minute. I look at the regulators who constantly seem asleep at the wheel and keep on missing obvious huge money laundering deals and try to ask why is that the case. I look at the debt markets, the sovereign debt markets, where incredible amounts of money are illicitly, legally provided to authoritarian kleptocratic governments without anybody caring whether they can ever repay. Often they don't and their citizens suffer. And then I try to look at natural resources, the arms trade. In each case, Western governments are highly complicit in helping multinational companies to secure deals that are so often secret and opaque. And then in the far, final part of the, the book, I talk about reforms, what we can do about them. But before going there, we might have, because we're going to have a conversation, we're not going to have a long book talk. Let me just give you one story out of this book, which is an unusual story. Um, I could tell you about nasty stories about bankers who lend to the worst people in the world and make huge problems, but I won't do that. I want to talk about illicit finance. Uh, my wife, Emily, is over here, and Emily and I ran an international uh, communications company for a number of years. And in 2011, we were the spokespeople for a syndicate of global investment institutions, including all of the world's largest banks, that had together made loans of $270 billion to the government of Greece. And the government of Greece, following the subprime debt crisis, the Great Recession, the government of Greece was bankrupt. It could not pay back the money. And so we were the spokespeople for the debt restructuring committee. And it was a harrowing time. The Greeks basically couldn't pay. If there was going to be any repayment of the 270 billion, it was going to come out of the European Union and the International Monetary Fund. Um, because the IMF is always there to bail out. It doesn't matter how corrupt the regime, they're always there to bail out. We could talk about um, what surprised me about all this was that I had been to Greece several times before then as guest of Transparency International Greece and learned a lot about corruption in Greece. And the dilemma, the crisis in Greece in 2010 came about when the Greek government had to admit to the European Union that all of its budget numbers for years had been made up. But in fact, they didn't have anything <laughs> like the tax revenues that they had kept on telling the European Union they had. Because it was cheaper for rich people in Greece to bribe the tax collector than pay the taxes. And there was a massive hole in the budget, and the country was bust. Um, you have to understand, and the country was bust. Um, you have to understand youth unemployment in 2011 in Greece was 55%. Average unemployment altogether in the country was 25%. The banks were bust. The country was bust. And you say to yourself, why did these bankers ever lend to this country? I mean, I've gone as a visitor and learned all about corruption in Greece. Where were the bankers? And the answer, and this is the point of the story, they didn't care about corruption. They weren't interested in corruption. They weren't interested if the money could ever be repaid because they were investing the money on behalf of their clients 
international investors, pension funds, insurance companies. It wasn't their money. They didn't care it wasn't being paid. All they cared about was the high management fees they got for arranging the deal. And they didn't care about the suffering of so many people as a result of the default on this on the debt. And today, Argentina is in default. It is the ninth time Argentina has defaulted. Imagine that. And it owes the IMF 44 billion because it's trying to bail them out. Zambia is in default. Lebanon is in default. This is the system we live in, in which bankers are supplying countries that pursue corruption with massive amounts of financial assistance. And we haven't even talked about money laundering. Massive amounts of financial assistance, but everywhere leaves victims. That's the motivation for writing the book. I've already introduced this at far too much length. So, <laughs> so chime in. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, well, thank you so much for, for that introduction and lots to unpack. Obviously, reading the book, uh, it, is, it is a great, it's a fantastic book that describes in rich detail a lot of the, diff a lot of the things that we are dealing with on a daily basis that we see and it puts them in perspective and allows us to have an entry point to understanding the systemic nature of corruption and the role that it enables us to play. So that's all good. And I obviously will encourage everyone to get the book. Um, before, we, before we go on further, just wanted to say I love that you lead this by focusing on the victims of corruption, the people who are affected by it, because I think that's oftentimes what in our technical discussions around beneficial ownership or around particular transparency measures about dashboards of this or that sort can get lost. Um, and there, there is an argument to be made that if, if all of us, the advocates in this space, but also the policymakers and the people in banks, if they, if they had a window to more clearly see how their decisions and how their actions affect others, that, that sort of empathy would, would go a long way. Um, you, you've also already started talking about the motivation of your book. So let me just um, ask you a little bit about that, because it seems to me there's sort of currently there's two trajectories. There's a moment. Uh, that we have in the anti-corruption space and with two sort of slightly diverging observations. Um, one is that on the one hand, the Pandora papers, you know, prior to that, the FinCEN leaks, the, the Paradise papers and all these revelations of corruption just, just corroborate that there is so much corruption out there, that we, we live in a world in which there is such a vast dimension of corruption affecting us and preventing governments from spending on service delivery or from making sure that that education gets gets done. Um, prior to that, we had a four-year administration here in the U.S. where you know there is a strong case to be made, and that is corroborated that uh, a lot of the actions there abused office for private gain. So, so corruption is all around us, and that is by itself a negative trajectory. That's something that we don't quite enjoy for obvious reasons. On the other hand, there is some optimism, and there is. A lot of good things happen. And uh, you know, just this past year, I think, uh, with the number of acts being passed or being introduced and passed by the House on the legislative end, but also when it comes to the administration, for example, elevating uh, corruption to be a national security issue and then uh, directing the different agencies to really, really work on this. Um, there, there are some, some positive signs as to where we're moving. The kleptocracy caucus, for example, people really picking up on this. So your book is both timely and, and really compelling. And I wonder, how do you see your book in this space between these two diverging trajectories? What's your motivation for writing this? How do you want to direct this? How should we read your book? What should we take away from that? <laughs> Maybe you should have answered it before we read the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, let, let me be brief because I, I want all of you to participate in this conversation this afternoon. Um, one of the things that became increasingly obvious after the Great Recession of 2008-2009 was increasing trends towards authoritarianism in the world. And with COVID, we've seen authoritarian regimes even deeper their grasp on power, locking down journalists, civil society activists. Um, we in PTF see how difficult it is for the civil society groups that we're working with to actually really monitor where the COVID money's going because of secrecy and, and so on. And there's an article, I think, in the Washington Post today about 
increasing challenges to democracy when the Swedish group has come out. And there's been more and more evidence of that. And the motivation for this book really is in that context. I think that democracy is something to be cherished and something we have to work for. And when we see the rise of authoritarianism, we realize that every single authoritarian government in the world today is run by a kleptocrat. That means somebody who steals from their people and their cronies. And when we realize that we are helping them to manage their money, their dirty money, in ways that makes them more secure and also makes them wealthier. We have to ask ourselves, are we actually helping this whole trend towards more authoritarianism? And are we doing it at a time when our own democracies are very troubled? And that was the prime motivation for this book. The good news, just because I don't want to be totally negative, even though when I look at what's happened in Sudan recently, and I look at what Bolsonaro is doing in Brazil, and I look at what's happened in Myanmar, I say, hey, you know, the good news, well, anyhow, the good news is that this Biden administration seems to agree, if you will, not just with me, but with this broad consensus that we are facing a serious challenge to democracy around the world from rising authoritarianism, and that focusing in on corruption and very importantly on human rights is crucial to trying to make <coughs> things. That's what the Summit for Democracy is all about, which takes place in three weeks' time. Um, so that's the driver. But we have to understand in the US that we are complicit. And until we fully recognize that, I am not quite so optimistic that we'll have the outcome. And our complicity includes the amount of money in politics. Which, which, of course, I think influences the whole agenda. That's excellent. And I'm going to pick up on that uh, right away. Um, and I really want to talk about one of the cases that you detail in the book. It's about the Malaysian Sovereign Wealth Fund. $4 billion stolen from the Malaysian Sovereign Wealth Fund. The, people the Pandora Papers, you know, prior to that, the FinCEN leaks, the, the Paradise Papers, and all these revelations of corruption just, just corroborate that there is so much corruption out there, that we, we live in a world in which there is such a vast dimension of corruption affecting us and preventing governments from spending on service delivery or from making sure that that education gets, gets done. Um, prior to that, we had a four-year administration here in the U.S. where, you know, there is a strong case to be made and that is corroborated that uh, a lot of the actions there abused office for private gain. So, so corruption is all around us, and that is by itself a negative trajectory. That's something that we don't quite enjoy for obvious reasons. On the other hand, there is some optimism, and there is a lot of good things happening. And uh, you know, just this past year, I think, uh, with a number of acts being passed or being introduced and passed by the House on the legislative end, but also when it comes to the administration, for example, elevating uh, corruption to be a national security issue and then uh, directing the different agencies to really, really work on this. Um, there, there are some, some positive signs as to where we're moving. The kleptocracy caucus, for example, people really picking up on this. So your book is both timely and, and really compelling. And I wonder, how do you see your book in this space between these two diverging trajectories? What's your motivation for writing this? How do you want to direct this? How should we read your book? What should we take away from that? Maybe you should have answered it before we read the book. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, let, let me be brief because I, I want all of you to participate in this conversation this afternoon. Um, one of the things that became increasingly obvious after the Great Recession of 2008-2009 was increasing trends towards authoritarianism in the world. And with COVID, we've seen authoritarian regimes even deeper their grasp on power, locking down journalists, civil society activists. Um, we in PTF see how difficult it is for the civil society groups that we're working with to actually really monitor where the COVID money is going because of secrecy and, and so on. And there's an article, I think, in the Washington Post today about increasing challenges to democracy when the Swedish group has come out. And there's been more and more evidence of that. And 
the motivation for this book really is in that context. I think that democracy is something to be cherished and something we have to work for. And when we see the rise of authoritarianism, we realize that every single authoritarian government in the world today is run by a kleptocrat. That means somebody who steals from their people and their cronies. And when we realize that we are helping them to manage their money, their dirty money, in ways that makes them more secure and also makes them wealthier, we have to ask ourselves, are we actually helping this whole trend towards more authoritarianism? And are we doing it at a time when our own democracies are very troubled? And that was the prime motivation for this book. The good news, just because I don't want to be totally negative, even though when I look at what's happened in Sudan recently, and I look at what Bolsonaro is doing in Brazil, and I look at what's happened in Myanmar, I say, hey, you know, the good news, well, anyhow, the good news is that this Biden administration seems to agree, if you will, not just with me, but with this broad consensus that we are facing a serious challenge to democracy around the world from rising authoritarianism, and that focusing on corruption and very importantly on human rights, is crucial to trying to make <coughs> things. That's what the Summit for Democracy is all about, which takes place in three weeks time. Um, so that's the driver. But we have to understand in the US that we are complicit. And until we fully recognize that, I am not quite so optimistic that we'll have the outcome. And our complicity includes the amount of money in politics. Which, which, of course, I think influences the whole agenda. That's excellent. And I'm going to pick up on that uh, right away. Um, and I really want to talk about one of the cases that you detail in the book. It's about the Malaysian Sovereign Wealth Fund. $4 billion stolen from the Malaysian Sovereign Wealth Fund, the people in We have to ask ourselves, are we actually helping this whole trend towards more authoritarianism? And are we doing it at a time when our own democracies are very troubled? And that was the prime motivation for this book. The good news, just because I don't want to be totally negative, even though when I look at what's happened in Sudan recently, and I look at what Bolsonaro is doing in Brazil, and I look at what's happened in Myanmar, I say, hey, you know, the good news, well, anyhow, the good news is that this Biden administration seems to agree, if you will, not just with me, but with this broad consensus that we are facing a serious challenge to democracy around the world from rising authoritarianism. And that focusing on corruption and very importantly on human rights is crucial to trying to make <coughs> things. That's what the Summit for Democracy is all about, which takes place in three weeks time. Um, so that's the driver. But we have to understand in the US that we are complicit. And until we fully recognize that, I am not quite so optimistic that we'll have the outcome. And our complicity includes the amount of money in politics, which, which of course, I think influences the whole agenda. That's excellent. And I'm going to pick up on that uh, right away. Um, and I really want to talk about one of the cases that you detail in the book. It's about the Malaysian Sovereign Wealth Fund. $4 billion stolen from the Malaysian Sovereign Wealth Fund. The people in implicated are the from a Prime Minister of uh, Malaysia, his stepson, family, friends. Uh, again, the money is stolen and you have the usual cast of uh, characters, bankers, real estate agents, lawyers. Uh, they go on a shopping spree with that money. They buy expensive real estate. They go on a shopping spree, not just in the United States, in UK, in Switzerland. There's a private jet involved. Um, there's expensive art. Um, all of this money spent. And... Um, and last year, Goldman Sachs, as you know, paid a nearly $3 billion fine for bribery involved with that case. Um, I understand that they also clawed back some executive compensation. Um, but today, if you look at the share price of Goldman Sachs, I would say it is higher than it was at that time last year, in October last year, when they paid the fine. 80% higher. So 80% <laughs> higher. So my question to you, and really to the audience, is that Say, and I see that in, in our family WhatsApp groups as well. Say if a 
company is is you know does ch uses child labor there is so much outrage but when a financial institution uh, pays bribery to the extent that it is fined nearly three billion dollars and the extent of it is huge i don't see that amount of uh, outrage amongst anyone i actually don't know how many have read the details of the case uh, that's one question and the second question is I know that Johannes said this, and you also referred to it, that there has been a step towards reform in the US. But I would argue that there are tiny steps. It's a very, very modest step towards reform, uh, where there are not, there is not still an ambitious agenda, in spite of all the large cases of corruption that we've seen. So I'll pause there. Would love to get your reaction. Well, let me give you a broad answer. Uh, and I, I'd love to have more conversations about this issue. Um, one of the activities that Emily and I in our business were very involved with for over 25 years uh, was working with the Institute of International Finance, which is associated with the largest banks in the world. So we worked with many of these people who ran these biggest banks. Um, and in the late 1990s, there was an enormous change in the way banking operated. New technologies have come on stream that accelerates the pace at which funds could be transferred from one country to another. The Glass-Steagall regulations in the US were put aside so there could be much more intensive competition between banks. And we had a regulatory regime run primarily by Adam Greenspan at the Federal Reserve Board that basically said markets will always correct themselves, which is a signal of basically saying we don't really have to regulate. The result was an intense increase in competition between banks. Uh, you saw Deutsche Bank buying a major bank in the United States, then HSBC did the same, uh, and so on and so on. Huge, huge intensification of competition. And at the same time, the bonuses went through the roof. And these bonuses are all based on short term profit, right? You get a maximized short term profit at the bank your bonus goes up. What was the result? A huge explosion in the first decade of this century in risk-taking. And what happened? The subprime mortgage crisis. Uh, and I quote in the book, uh, Chuck Prince, who was the head of Citibank at one point, who when asked, why did you keep on doing this when you knew that this was dangerous? He said, well, you have to keep dancing till the music stops. And the music stopped and we were, banks were almost totally bankrupt. But at the very same time as that subprime stuff was happening, there was an explosion in money laundering activities and criminal activities by the major banks. And a number of them got caught with some major affairs, but basically most of them got away with a lot. And those bonuses went up, which encouraged them to do more. So what I'm saying is there was a incredible change in culture. In an earlier era in which I was a reporter, interestingly enough, there were a lot of bankers around who had a very deep sense of the public interest. When the Latin American debt crisis exploded in the 80s, we saw the banks work very closely with the Federal Reserve and with the IMF to work out constructive solutions. And those solutions led, in fact, to the birth of some democracies in Latin America, getting rid of most of the generals. And that was part of the whole package, a part of the aid. Uh, I got hired at the World Bank by a man called Tom Clawson, who had been the chairman of the Bank of America, which at the time was the biggest bank in the world. And he was very strongly dedicated to issues of population increase and to poverty, which he talked to me a lot about way before he ever thought of joining the World Bank. A lot of these bankers coming with their background in the Depression and in, the, and in World War II, had a deep sense that their institutions had to serve the public interest. And they made that the key objective. And so in one of the chapters in the book, I talk about banking culture and the need to get back to that sense of serving the public interest. And I believe that there can be enough shareholder pressure, just as we're seeing shareholder pressure now on the environmental issues and the banks enough pressure, but it's going to be tough to get that 
to change from this immediate short-term risk, high profit, high bonus culture. It's very difficult, but uh, I think we need cultural change at the banks. I don't think you can just legislate that, although we can take a lot of actions, administrative actions, we'll talk about that later, also in the book, about what we do about the banks. But I think uh, culture is something that we don't talk enough about. And it's, it's really important. So that is one part of my question. My other part was really about the social sanctioning, right? Which you would say, if say an organization or a company was using child labor, we would stop buying their products. I don't see uh, organizations or bankers or lawyers or anyone like the kind you mentioned in your book facing that kind of what I would say social outrage for the. For I, I don't think, honestly, I don't think they ever will. So I think we have to look at other things that we could do. Uh, all of you are far too young to remember the collapse of Enron 20 years ago. But when Enron did collapse, and Tyco, and WorldCom, and by the way, the chief executives were sentenced to 20 and 25 year prison terms. Uh, and Trudy can correct me because she's the real expert on this. Congress passed the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. And one of the key provisions in that was that the, I believe, was that the chairman of the board, or the chief executive officer, had yes. to sign the financial statements as being accurate. Certified, yes. Certified. And if, if that wasn't the case, that person could be criminally prosecuted. Criminally prosecuted. Now think for a moment. Not a single one of the top bankers of the world's largest banks has ever been criminally prosecuted for money laundering. In fact, in Britain, the guy who headed HSBC during the worst of their money laundering for the Mexican drug cartels sits in the House of Lords. As a member of these and his predecessor was also involved, got a knighthood from the Queen for services to banking. We have to change this. <laughs> I think. And, and so how do we change it? I think we should have something like Sarbanes Oxley in the banking world. We should have a statement in the annual report of every major enabling institution, including the real estate firms and the law firms, that certifies that their organization has not paid bribes or violated the FCPA or violated anti money laundering laws. And if it proves that they are, in fact, wrong, then they could be criminally prosecuted. And I believe that, you know, when top executives have to sign a piece of paper, that influences the tone at the top. And if you want cultural change, you have to change the tone at the top. And so this may be very, you know, optimistic to talk about these laws, but we have to do something to make these people, to punish those who commit the crimes. You know, let, to, we'll let, let me jump in. And, uh, jump in and then we'll, please. You know. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, just to pick up on what you've just said and what you do in the book. So, so there is a, at all times in your book, there is this narrative that underlies all the many, many uh, stories, anecdotes, the, the, uh, the cases that you refer to, which is really about power and incentives. And, and oftentimes, as you just did now, there, there is a way for us to think about, on the one hand, accept or acknowledge that oftentimes corruption is per perpetrated by those in power. You know, which results in additional power, additional money. But on the other hand, that we oftentimes try to work on this through incentives and, and disincentives. And some of that is misguided because we know that simply putting a fine to banks will not result in a, in a culture shift at banks. However, if and when, and as you say, if there was a way to, to indeed punish the, the top executives, maybe that would be the right incentive. And that is something to, to pick up on and to further explore, including perhaps through legislation. The one caveat that I warn about in the book at the end is we really have to understand money and politics. The enabling community, the banks, insurance companies, lawyers, and so on, have enormous political influence. They are, they network. I've, we've seen it up close. They network furiously to become part of the influence political elites of their countries. They are. And they influence all this with their campaign contributions in this country, with their lobbying, 
in order to ensure against tough regulation and to ensure against the kind of laws that would punish them. And they're very successful. And if we don't talk more about money and politics in this context, I think we're missing part of the whole of the whole picture. But so you had a thing, and then, then let's leave. Yes, uh, I'm just. Yeah. Um, you you just mentioned that you wanted another Sarbanes Oxley, another law, but you know from times immemorial, corruption has been there. Yes, like she mentioned, she was born in India. I was born in 1942 in India, mm -hmm. uh, and I've seen the corruption that British perpetrated Absolutely. and got away. With, and and then our own people came and they refined <laughs> those practices and continued because they said Nehru said we need. A constitution, it's going to continue. So, so everything continued. So our people became as corrupt or probably worse sometimes than the British did in India. Uh, but they were there to rob India anyway. So one argues that uh, they did the right thing. They were corrupt. <laughs> they even waived the death penalties by taking bribe <laughs> in India. So given that, I have a feeling now, right now, we see Joe Biden and his son have been accused of corruption. And if you hear the right wing, if you hear Fox News, they're coming up with evidence after evidence, nothing, because the Fox is guarding the chicken. Yeah. So given whoever is in power, their corruption, it's that, that old saying that if your people commit violence, they are freedom fighters. And those who become victim of those freedom fighters, they got called the terrorists. The same thing. If your people, your supporters, because you know the entire U.S. political system is based on large donors financing these politicians. So Congress has no authority on morality because they are all corrupt. The president runs with big money, and I'm told that if you pay above 100,000, you can get an ambassadorship to England because that is one of the coveted uh, jobs that you get when you donate to presidential campaign in this country. And if you give that kind of money, then you'd be listened to and you'd be considered. And a lot of times you get it. If not London, you'll get somewhere else in Norway or, or maybe sent to India. <laughs> If you pay a lot of money and you're not a very desired person, go to a country that we don't have good relations. So corruption is embedded in this country. Corruption is embedded in India. We are all democracies, <laughs> corrupt democracies, let's put it this way. Given what do we, I, I well, don't think you know, there is any solution think, except I think in the US modeling too, truth. I, in I, the I early just, 90s, we had the savings and loan crisis. We yeah. threw 1,800 bankers in jail. It's a, it's a factor, it's a difference. Between then, 20, 30 years and, ago, you know, and in 2008, really, it's a part of that. humanity. Indian finance yeah, minister was in this country. Don't have and the said, will to you know, know, we had corruption, so, but it, it wasn't as bad. Please, please, you, you had some. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, well, I wanted right. to add to everything that he was saying, which is 100% true. I think that it really doesn't have anything to do with the fact that you have power, I'm sorry, but you have no power as humanity, as people. To an extent, we are just corrupt. I, Given the opportunity to make money, we go yeah. You know, I, I hear you. I, I hear you. And uh, I'm not going to, I'm certainly not going to argue with your points. But 30, almost 30 years ago, a couple of friends of mine and I started a group called Transparency International. And this was the first international NGO to try to combat corruption. And the economist carried a cartoon of Don Quixote and Sancho Panza <laughs> uh, tilting at windmills. Um, today, Transparency International has 100 national chapters. And across the world, and I wrote about this in my last book, uh, across the world, there are an enormous number of courageous people who are willing to go to jail, and some of them do. Uh, in investigative journalism, in civil society, who are leading protests. There have been more protests in the last 10 years against corruption in more countries than probably in all of history put together. And these people, and I have an enormous confidence and belief in civil society activism, 
are speaking truth to power. And in many countries, they are having an influence. And if we think of India, I met a wonderful woman a few years ago, and you may know her name, I've forgotten it, who led a campaign for 30 years for the right to information law in India. And that law is incredible. Because once that law got on, once that law got on the books, it's getting subverted by the government. Yeah. Well, but wait a second. <laughs> once that law got on the books, a lot of civil society groups in India have been able to use it to expose a lot of corruption. You can see from some of the work that the Partnership for Transparency Fund has done with in a whole variety of communities, how women have come together. So often it's women in these countries who do the courageous work how women have come together to go to the local authorities and say, we have a right to information. We want to see the books. We want to see the public employment registers because we know that you have given vouchers for public employment to people who died years ago so that you could keep the wages. And the use of the right to information law and the fact that you've got courageous groups of civil society people in so many countries who are willing to try and make a difference I think is very, very encouraging. And I, in that sense, do not uh, underestimate the efforts that some people with their offices here in, in the Open Gov Hub are trying to make to influence Congress and trying to speak truth to power. So I think it's easy to be cynical. I think it's right to be skeptical. But I think at the same time, look at what's happening in so many countries and I think there is some basis there's some very cautious optimism and hope. I hope. I do, I do want to add to that because I do want to acknowledge your point. Really, uh, especially because the Summit for Democracy is coming up, I think it is fundamental for the United States to look at our own legal loopholes right here that exist right here and to actually do something about addressing that. And as you have well pointed out, the last four or five years has shown us that we cannot rely on a president to address his own conflicts of interest. So you really do need right. legal safeguards in place and you need legal safeguards in place which prevent members of Congress from benefiting from stock trades uh, <laughs> uh, and things like that. So we do, we do need these legal safeguards. And I think, I, I, I think to be a credible voice for fighting uh, corruption around the world, the US does need to acknowledge that we do have a problem right here at home. And I think that is that is a fundamental thing. So to add to what Frank said, I agree. There are lots of organizations around the world who are doing great work. There are lots of people who need our support. But I think that without the US addressing its uh, own problems, we cannot tell other people what to do, which we don't do ourselves. I, I, I agree with you there. Couple very quick comments. Oh, sorry. Yes. Okay. We no. have one question from the folks online. Okay. Well, let, shall we shall we go there first, and then and then go straight to your question comments? Yeah. Right. Yes. It will be quick, and then I have one okay. more question for you after yours. So this question is from Barbara Keller. She's asking, "What are your expectations for the Democracy Summit next month? And if given the opportunity, what would you advise the Biden administration?" Okay. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll bear that. You put some comments, and then we'll take them together. Just a, as a fascinating, really impassioned discussion. Uh, you, know, you talk about the rise of authoritarianism and the enabling aspects. Part of the enablement is also the public. Uh, and this co combines with the rise, with these authoritarians' use of populism, of dividing publics into an us and them. And in and that corruption, I think, is sort of was noted, is all right for the us, because it helps us defeat them. And dealing with civil society, whether it's Transparency International, uh, whether it's all civil society linked with George Soros, uh, the you know, these authoritarian governments now are casting civil society as the them. Uh, that needs to be crushed, that's interfering in, in uh, the, the, the domestic politics. Uh, and the, it, it's, a, it's a very heated and close competition so that even when everything is transparent, when the, uh, when the Pandora Papers publish uh, what's going on with folks like Babbage, 
still a very close collection. Yeah. It's not as if as if making that information public says we shouldn't be supporting these people because the, the public is enabling their guy. Uh, and their guy has effectively divided the publics into two. How, how, do, how do we address that? Well, I get my quote to answer because, but basically it means that people like us working with civil society have to work harder. <laughs> we have to do a better job. We have to get even more information out. And that comes to the question also of the Summit for Democracy because it cannot just be a talking shop. It cannot just bring together representatives of 100 governments who all make wonderful statements about anti-corruption and human rights and then go home again. It has to be, we have, we have moved to the point where we absolutely need concrete actions. I lay out a whole bunch of concrete actions in my book, but others will have other concrete actions that they want to see. But the point is that we in civil society, if you will, together with journalists, together with many others, have to hold the feet of these top leaders who come to the summit to the fire. And we have to say, look at your own countries first, including President Biden here in the US. Look at your own countries first and see what you need to do to clean up the corruption in your own countries before you start saying, you know, we're all gonna impose more sanctions on, on Putin. On everyone else. <laughs> um, yeah, or whatever. I mean, I think sanctions are great, but they're not sufficient. So I think we all have to do a better job. And if you and my expectations for the sub democracy are low, because I really do fear we're going to have another big talking shop. And we had a summit against money laundering in 2016 in Britain, uh, chaired by David Cameron. Uh, well, Trudeau was there, and there were great speeches. John Kerry made a fantastic speech on behalf of the United States. And then we had Trump, and look what happened. So we have to keep fighting and we have to keep the pressure on. But... So I would add specifically on the Summit for Democracy, the one key thing to make it successful and not just this summit, next year's summit and the year of action that comes between this year and next year when they have the second summit is consultation and broad consultation with all stakeholders. As a person who works uh, for a civil society organization, I do feel we've been shut out of the summit to a large extent. And for any anti-corruption summit to be successful, you have to involve stakeholders. That would be my one suggestion. And I, I would I would add in, you know, picking up on this conundrum that you both mentioned about us ourselves and the us versus them, that and that also is reflected in your book. So, so there's a role for regulation, there's a role for principal agents stuff, for people punishing others, for oversight, for additional transparency. But, and that's the last chapter in your book, there's also a role for us to scrutinize and think again about what is public interest? What do we as citizens do in our own lives? How do we enact democracy? What do we, you know, what are the things that we do in our neighborhoods or beyond our neighborhoods in our towns? And how do we try to make a link between what we want to see, what we define as public interest, what we, what we discuss with each other to then aggregate that up to higher levels of, of governance in our respective country. And by the way, I, I find, again, that that is one of the things in your book that is really compelling to, to not leave it at, let's say, a laundry list of, of items, but to bring it back and essentially show us the mirror and say, you know, have we done a good enough job of thinking through what we want to see from us ourselves and from our leaders? I, I just want to make one other point. As we're running out of time, I think I want to make one other major point. We've just had the Glasgow Summit on the Environment. And it's really important, I think, for people to consider the degree to which corruption is damaging success in cleaning up the environment and climate change. I give just one example in the book. I could have given many more, but I, I, that wasn't really the main theme of the book. But the example I give is in, in illegal logging and deforestation. The Glasgow Summit announced already that they wanted to reduce sharply deforestation. 30% of all logging in the world is illegal. It is done by organized crime, by paying off government officials. The money gets laundered through the whole system. Now, just imagine, just to give one example, just imagine 
if every single Home Depot, Ikea, and everybody else had to put a sign on every plank of wood and every piece of furniture that said that they had certified that the wood came from legal logging. Consumers can make a difference. And that's, translate that in a wider sense, but it brings together the very topical issue of climate change and, and corruption. And of course, money. And I think we need to be more opportunistic of it too. We shouldn't put all these issues in silos. We should look at them together and then think what we can do. And you know, just campaigning for that sort of certification on logging alone, furniture alone. You know, who knows whether actually none of this looks like wood, but <laughs> any of the wood products we you, you know, who knows where it comes from. So I just make that as another example about concrete, constructive things that, that could be done. Um, yes. Yeah, but unfortunately, what you say is maybe not even enough because, <clears throat> for example, I was reading about this uh, palm oil uh, certification right. in Indonesia, Malaysia, Malaysia, these countries, that many of the certifications are false. Yes. So they certify that this, or this palm oil has not caused the proliferation, and it's not true. Even then, they say they are using blockchain technologies, etc. So it's not even, easy. I, I, I agree. It's not easy, but if you don't make a start at it, I yeah. agree. I so, agree. Are there any more so, comments from, from online that we should quickly, that your hands can quickly give? Not at the moment, but we are at time. It's exactly five o'clock. I do have a question or request from all of you. If you were to leave us with one food for thought, one takeaway um, from each one of you from this conversation, if we forget everything else, but we remember this one thing, what would it be? Well, you want me to start? Sure. Uh, Anti-corruption is a universal challenge. We have a, a lot more corruption in the US and we enable a lot more corruption around the world than we have been willing to fully admit to. If we all work together, recognizing the universality of the problem, the transnational nature of the problem, I think we can make a lot more progress. Uh, and it starts, frankly, with Western countries and Western major corporations understanding we are complicit and we are part of the problem. Once we recognize that we're part of the problem, I think we go to the next step of solving that. But we still are not yet there. We are not adequately paying attention to the degree to which we are part of the universal problem of corruption. Um, so I will, um, I will leave a more positive thought, though some of my comments may have not seen like that. Uh, been uh, seen like that. I would say the one thought we should take away from Frank's book and really this conversation about anti-corruption is the tone starts at the top. Whether it's a country or an organization or a financial institution, the tone starts at the top. So what you see in terms of a culture is what is set really at the top. I say that because, uh, you know, as you know, the United States has recently decided that corruption is a national security issue. We see a lot of attention being diverted to the Summit for Democracy. We see a lot of announcements by, um, uh, by top level officials which are talking about corruption. And I do think it will have a trickle down effect. It's a positive thought. I'll say that because uh, End of October, the Deputy Attorney General made an important speech, uh, Lisa Monaco, at the uh, annual conference of the American Bar Association, which would be a tough crowd because it's all lawyers. And she said, we are going to focus at the Justice Department on two things. One is individual accountability, so holding senior officials accountable uh, when companies commit fraud, corruption, all kinds of issues, money laundering, and the second thing she said is we are going to look very, very carefully at repeat offenders. So say if a company has committed uh, a crime in one area um, and then it comes up again and tries to get a settlement rather than being prosecuted or pleading guilty, then we are going to look really very, very carefully at that. I say that even because uh, just a couple of days ago, I got a call from another journalist who said they are hearing a lot of statements, even from the SEC and from Gary Gensler talking about the issue of gatekeepers, which is really the fundamental issue of enablers. And gatekeepers are gatekeepers both within the company and outside of the company. Uh, and there's a lot more focus on that. And they wanted my views on that. So I would say that 
if we keep pushing on these issues, we will see a change. Um, and, and none of the regulators or policymakers are what I would say impervious to public opinion, to advocacy. Uh, so I think we have to keep doing our work and keep doing it harder. You've got the final word. <laughs> no, no, you're going to say, you're going to tell everyone, you're going to tell one word, buy my book. <laughs> of course. I, I would argue the one thing that is worthwhile pondering and, and really trying to work out is we fight corruption effectively when we build on each other's work. There is no point in any of us doing stuff on our own and trying to push ahead with yet one new law legislation or one new dashboard or one new organization that we make work. There is much more value in looking around us and seeing what another person is doing and what they have already achieved and learning from that and building on that work and trying to enhance it a little bit and trying to work with each other to make this whole system, this web of us working on anti-corruption efforts to work more smoothly and to, to get to a better state. Okay, Isabel. Yeah, what's that? Okay, well, thank you, everybody. I... Thank you, Open Government Hub, for, for doing this. Thank you, Rachel, so much for, help, for organizing this. Uh, I'm enormously appreciative. Uh, love to hear from you once you've read the book. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful. Thank and you. then, as we're wrapping up, uh, thank you to everybody online who joined us. We're going to move to our cafe. For the for the knowledge cafe part and some refreshments as well. Okay. Um, if you'd like to stick around here, that's okay too. But before you go, please fill out a really short survey. It's on the table, and then we'll show you where to go for the reception. Thank you so much, Frank. Thank you, Johannes. Thank you, Shruti, and everyone here. Thank you.